holy cow, you just stumbled upon the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast in the world. This is Mind Pump. All right, you guys want a free program? Would you like free access to MAPS HIT? That's high-intensity interval training done right. Helps you burn body fat and get new levels of stamina. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours underneath this podcast when we drop it. Make it a good comment, okay? And if we pick your comment, you get free access to MAPS HIT, which is a wonderful wonderful program. Also, if you want to get in on when we give away stuff, which is every single episode, make sure you turn on notifications and subscribe to this channel. So you know when we drop an episode, you can get in the comments and enter to win free stuff. And we give away a lot of really cool free stuff. So make sure you do that. Oh, one more thing. We got a huge promotion going on right now. One day left, 24 hours left on our huge pre-summer sale. Here's the stuff that's 50% off right now, and that'll be gone tomorrow. You get 50% off MAPS HIT, you can get 50% off MAPS SPLIT, or you can get 50% off the Bikini Bundle. You can find all of those at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code SPRINGBREAK. All right, enjoy the podcast. All right, Adam. Yeah. Calling me out today. What? Because I come in and I'm like, ah, I'm in bodybuilder mode. And he's like, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, why, do you, why do you have so much weight on the bar on your deadlifting? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> bodybuilders don't do singles. Yeah. Bodybuilder deadlifts. Yeah, he's over there. Do you know do, the difference? Yeah, he's over there pulling like five five plus. I don't even know how much was on there. It looked like a lot. It looked like 550 or more. And uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm bodybuilding. Now. You know what I said that? Yeah. You know what? I'm, First of all, most bodybuilders <laughs> I've calmed don't, way down. Yeah, I was like, most bodybuilders don't even deadlift. The ones that do deadlift are not doing. You know what? Though? Okay, so here's what I mean when I say that. Because my <laughs> my, my work here's how my workouts change when I'm in bodybuilder mode, right? Uh, besides deadlifts, I tend to focus more on feel, and I'm not as strong, so I I have to switch my mentality because otherwise it starts to mess with me. But it's mainly diet, dude. My workouts change a little bit. But it's mainly diet. And this weekend, the diet was I don't know if I'm going to let you get away with it, though. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to let you get away with calling that bodybuilder mode, bro. Just because you start to cut My calories. My bodybuilder mode? <laughs> yes, All right, fine. Yeah. Cutting mode. How about yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, because I cut calories way down, uh, way down. And I just where's dropped. everybody? Okay, so where's everybody at weight-wise? Because we, we we weighed in that the vlog, right, yeah. when we first started. And I, and I, I was 235. Wow. So you ready, Sal? Two thirty-four. You were. I was two fifteen or two sixteen. Two. Oh, good. Two twenty. Two fifteen. Two sixteen. Yeah. Two yeah, twenty-seven. You were. Yeah, you were in the middle. Dude, am I like? Are you two two seven? Yeah. So where's everybody at now to to compare? Well, so trip off this, right? So I haven't weighed myself. You haven't. You no. got fatter than. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ew. <laughs> no, I don't want to look. We should make him go right now. I think. I no. him go go lay your ass. No, right so now. you know. Okay, so I probably got a little huskier. A yeah. little bit. I don't know, man. That butt video we had with the bar rolling over your butt. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it didn't even make it over your hamstrings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just like, bounced right back. Yeah. So, no, uh, I I, uh, I was really motivated because my gut starts to act up with too many calories and carbohydrate. I think like you, Adam, except you feel like achy. Yeah. Where you start to cut calories. Yeah. For me, it's my, my gut health. So I cut my carbs way down. Holy cow, do I drop water. Like crazy. I must hold on to so much water from eating carbohydrates. So my weight went 216 down to 208 okay, in, in so like a week. So you're down eight. Way, yeah, way down. How about you? Yeah, I'm about 10 down. So I, I weighed uh, day before yesterday, I weighed at 225. So and I was, what did I say? I was 235 or 236. Oh, okay. So I'm down 10, 11 pounds nice, right nice. around there. Mostly water, of course, right? So it's, uh, and I've leaned out uh, a little bit. Now, what are you doing with the diet? Just cutting down? Well, you, you remember that that episode not long ago, I shared how I did that week of really, really low calorie. Yeah. That dropped the initial. And then I stayed pretty low uh, most of the week. I did have a high cal day yesterday. I hadn't had like a, I, and I wanted like a real good refeed. And the way I based it off of, we were talking off air um last week when we were all working out and uh the workouts is what is always tough for me when i well that's not the only thing that's tough there's two things that are really tough for me when cutting calories is the significant drop in strength mm -hmm. um i i noticed and some people are differently not everybody's like this some people can reduce their calories and they see a little bit of a strength difference not a big difference i see a significant difference like yeah. i am a lot weaker low cal than i am when i'm completely fed and then the other thing is uh, i'm not filled in 
So, uh, you know, I have this like, you know, all, all my clothes are fitting kind of loose. And so even though I'm leaner and getting in better shape, uh, psychologically, it always messes with it, it pulls out the, you know, the skinny kid, you know, totally. insecurity that mm. I've always had. Totally. So I always have to have this self-talk of like, it's you're fine. Do you, you're good. Do yeah. you, now, do you have any mental games you play with yourself to get yourself in the right state of mind? Because uh, sure. I wear smaller shirts like you. To uh, yeah, so. <laughs> no, hey, hold on. Really? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So your same. son's shirt. Yeah, oh no. If yeah. I, no I have, I have like, you, you have know. to see the definition. Yeah, so I, got, forget it. I got a closet full of, you know, Katrina makes fun of me. All your skinny time. clothes. Yeah, I do. I have like, so I have, <laughs> I have like all kind of all phases, especially when I was competing, you know, the, obviously I, I fluctuated weight a ton during those times. So, and I haven't thrown those clothes out because I, I can, I can manipulate my weight, uh, really 20 to 30 pounds uh, and be all different versions of myself, meaning I can be lean at the highest weight, lean at the lowest weight and vice versa. Right. So I have like sections of t-shirts that, you know, when I'm like really big and jacked and filled out, like I can wear these, you know, triple X and kind of really big, big double X type shirts. And then I have like, you know, when I'm, when I'm feeling really small and so, so that I'll wear like my, my large lean, extra large type of t-shirts. When do you pull out the stringers? <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I, I haven't, I don't know if I still have any. I think at the last, uh. Where your nipple pokes out the side. Yeah. It just, it just goes down to I'm not, I, I have said Fred mesh shirts. Yeah. 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 I got a few of those. I have to be shredded to wear yeah, those. You know yeah. What yeah I mean? Just mid drifts. That's when I do yeah, that. when I was competing, I was definitely into that. But part of that, honestly, it was, you know, when you're you're critiquing your physique, uh, like I never wore I never wore stringers until competing. Like I never did that. I was always a guy. I actually used to be, um, you know, when I I came up with these guys lifting, they were big on like staying covered up in layers. You know, you wear the the triple X shirts and big sweaters. Don't let anybody see what's yeah, going on. Yeah, you know, so you were all undercover. You know, you only get to see me if you went to the beach or something or out in pub or out outside of the gym. So, I never really wore the stringers and wife beaters and tank top stuff until I got into competing. When I'm like, and I'm definitely looking at myself the entire time because I'm judging yeah. uh, my physique, like when where I need to work on. And so for me. Uh, that's the only time that really existed, and, and since I'm obviously not competing or nowhere near that kind of shape, I don't I don't rock. Yeah, stuff. I got to do the I got to do I have to see what's going on. Otherwise, I just focus on the weight, and I'm not as strong. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go eat some French fries. Yeah, get some of the strength back. How, how about you, Justin? Do you uh, do you change your clothes? Has your I, I don't really put a lot of thought into that. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'll, I'll give you like. I have this one shirt that's a long sleeve shirt and uh, I don't know. Well, obviously I know why, because it's tighter, like in certain specific spots in my arms where it like shows the definition. I'm always like, Ooh, eh. like it's like my power shirt, yeah. you know, like, but that's it. Like I don't, I didn't like figure that out till just recently. Like, oh, I could buy more of these kinds of shirts to kind of show this work off, but it's just like. Oh, this one's cool, and I like, put it on. There's Justin, so Justin changes things up based off of like, um, you know, I always notice he switches his workouts based off of like if he hasn't been doing rotational stuff or he hasn't yeah. been dragging. Yeah, the he sweat. has the healthiest uh, approach. I, I would, I would, yeah. I would say. Well, right. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't, I have a different perspective, you know. Than, but again, like that's why it's it's good to like intermingle and and try and like focus on like getting muscle definition again. Like I'm actually, I want to do that. So that's like something I'm trying to I focus on. I, I, you know, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm more like just in this area now. Like that's like the, my workouts right now currently reflect like how I feel. Like I'm not, I'm not pushing weight really hard. I'm not really focused on, you know, building an aesthetic physique right now. It's uh, I've got right now, I've got the uh, golfer's elbow going on right now. So I got joint and I got elbow, hip Doesn't stuff. it suck when you get golfer's elbow, but you don't golf? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> and, and you know it, it, irony. It, it flared up after the first day of like heavy I get a basketball ankle and <laughs> First yeah, day after dude. heavy deadlifting, and uh, it face. definitely felt it. <laughs> Same thing going with uh, I went really heavy squats a couple weeks ago, and then my so you know as soon as my body starts talking to me like that, um, I can I can shut it down. I can shut down the the meathead side of me and get more into like functional. Well, training. you know, we, we talk a lot about trainers, obviously, on the show because we were all trainers for most of our careers. But I, I this is one of the reasons why I always recommend because people we get the question right: Should trainers be fit? Should they be super into exercise and nutrition? And from a visual standpoint, yes, there's some marketing value. I could see that. Obviously, it's going to be harder to get people to hire you if you don't look like you work out. But here's the real value. Uh, you know, I think you have to experience 
a lot of the mental states that your clients may experience so that you can communicate to it better and be more effective. Yep. And one of them is this. Here's one of the main reasons why I've always advocated, and you guys do the same, with phasing your workouts versus, you know, instead of doing like some, you know, Mondays are high reps and Wednesdays are low reps and mixing it all up. The, one of the reasons why I recommend phasing it, same reason why, what, like what we're talking about now, there's a mental state that goes along, goes along with training heavy. There's a mental state that goes along with working on mobility. There's a mental state that goes on with, with bodybuilding. And you have to switch gears, get in that mental state. Otherwise, it gets very challenging. If I'm in a strength <clears throat> mental state, good luck get, trying to get me to do mobility appropriately. It's just, it's so much harder. I have to switch gears and then stay there and I'm much more effective in that phase. It's not just mm -hmm. that. There's there's also this this huge individual variance uh, between everybody that, you know, it's it's good to see what serves your body best. Yes, definitely. You know, and so if you're all, if you're kind of like, throwing everything at your body all the time where it's like I got high rep, low rep, heavyweight, lightweight. I've got super setting. I've got long rest periods. I've got powerlifting type stuff. I got kettlebell work. I've got mobility stuff. And you kind of like throw it all in your routine. It's really hard to measure uh, what's really helping you specifically the most at where you're currently at in your life. And so that's the reason why I find the most value. And of course, the, the, the research and studies support it. It's one of the, if not the best way to train is to do that. But I really think a lot of it's the, the psychological part. The studies talk about the physiological part that's right. beneficial, which, you know, we could talk all day long. We could debate that. Right. right. And there's camps that might debate, you know, changing it. And a lot, of, and it's really close, right? The studies show that if you do change things up every single day, it's really close to somebody who phases their workouts. Not much of a difference. But that's not the reason why I think it's so important. I think the psychological part is what's really important because a lot of people don't know what's really working in their routine. And so being consistent with a phase or a modality, a way of training for a long enough period of time, you know, four to six weeks gives you like some really good feedback to then go back to the yeah, drawing table. Think about how mm -hmm. long did it take you guys to get a client? Let's just, I'll paint, I'll, I'll create a fictional, uh, a fictitious client here. How long would it take you to get a woman who wants to burn body fat to get into the build strength, build muscle, build metabolism mentality. Oh, uh, a long time. Yeah, it's not one workout. No. It takes a little while. Well, what if I go one workout, we're focused on that. Oh, don't worry, Wednesday we're doing HIIT training. And then Thursday we're doing it, – it's – it's you're going to be in an uphill battle. you got to get them in that mental state to really make what you're working towards uh, truly effective. And as a trainer, doing it yourself, you get it. Right? I get it. Like I, mm -hmm. like I was just telling you guys. It, I finally switched over to, what I mean by bodybuilding mode is focusing on definition, looking at my exercises as a means to an end versus like, I got to lift more, I want to get stronger. It takes a second to switch yeah, over. I mean, you're 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 totally changing up the, the intent of everything you're doing. So it's like really you're walking into the gym, like trying to accomplish different uh, goals for that day and, and, and to, to be able to work through those exercises in a different way. So yeah, it does require that a lot of times. Uh, and it's usually what you don't want to do because you're so set in what you're doing and it's, everything was going well and easy. And now, you know, the, the real like transformation and change is going to happen when you work in a completely different direction. Yeah, totally. All right. So speaking about training, so this weekend I had some time alone. Uh, Jessica took the baby to the park for a few hours and I just geeked out on nutrition studies and supplement studies. And I read up a lot about a supplement that we've all been using forever that's been around for a long time, fish oil. Mm -hmm. There's some really interesting, so there's there's, debate. A, lot of, there's a lot of controversy around. So, okay, so I, I, yes, I get some of that, but I also don't because uh, a lot of the evidence is pretty damn strong. And then my personal experience and then my client's experience with fish oil has always been excellent. It's one of the most effective single supplements I've ever seen reduce my client's uh, stiffness and mm -hmm. improve mobility. Well, there's there's lots of studies that support this. There's studies that show, so if you're somebody that is always pushing yourself to the limit, you're training really hard and recovery becomes, it's like you're on a razor you know, edge, right? Am I doing too much? Am I not doing enough? When you're really training at peak intensity, fish oil makes a big difference. And studies show, there's actually a couple studies that showed that people who supplemented with fish oil either did not lose strength or lost minimal strength post uh, a strenuous workout. So after a really, really hard, let's say, leg workout, mm. the day or two after, you're not going to be as strong in your legs because of the damage or whatever. People who took fish oil didn't lose strength or lost far less than people who didn't. 
It also is shown to improve mobility tremendously. So if you have issues with mobility, you're focusing on mobility. As like a joint lubricant. Absolutely. Yeah. And then here's another one. In people who are older, there's a study that shows that people who supplemented with fish oil built more muscle. Mm -hmm. The fish oil itself uh, with the other controls shows that it actually built more muscle. So I, the study that I would like to see with it, and, and what I've heard uh, that's conflicting with, with uh, omega-3s, is if you have a really poor diet and you consume a lot of omega sixes and nines, that it outcompetes the threes in the cell. So let's say you have somebody who's like fast food, bad, really bad diet, but they their doctor or Sal tells them, you know, all the great research around omega threes. So they throw the omega threes on it. I hear that you may as well flush it down the toilet because the six isn't, if you're taking that much in, you're over consuming calories, you're over consuming saturated fats, you have a bad diet. Then, and then you also take the fish oil, it basically, it, the sixes and nines outcompete the threes. So here's in my experience working with uh, clients whose diets weren't the greatest, but I did talk them into using fish oil for inflammation, mainly for inflammation. Mm -hmm. They would have to take high doses. So I would have them take six, eight, 10 grams of fish oil, which is about six, eight, 10 grams. Typically capsules, for oh, example. Wow. Those are uh, big capsules too. Yeah, so like mm -hmm. uh, the, the one that I like, I'm using right now is Legion's uh, Triton. I like his his product. What's his called? It's called Triton. Triton, yeah, really, really good product. Obviously, you know, Matt, Mike's supplements are excellent. The god, but that's six, the god of the, the, god of the sea. <laughs> it is yeah, god yeah, of the yeah. sea. Yeah. It's so very, it's very it's, clever, Mike. Yeah, I know Aquaman's a friend or whatever. But <laughs> it's, <laughs> <laughs> six to is six to ten of those uh, capsules spread out throughout the day. So you would do like. Three with breakfast, three with lunch. Three now, with see, would that breakfast. matter though? I mean, based off of what I'm talking about, is that the sixes and nines are, from what I've heard, that's or what read, I'm saying. I think taking more than that, it doesn't doesn't matter. Based off of what I've read, is that mm -hmm. it's it's they're still stronger. Well, you still it's, have to remove that out of your diet. Yeah, like they would outcompete it. So it's you know, if if there was an equal even amount of threes that you took mm -hmm. in, it wouldn't matter because the sixes and nines are are will outcompete the threes. So from what I've been reading, it makes somewhat of a difference. But let's be honest trying to fix a bad diet with right, right. some yeah. fish oil well, <laughs> so that's i mean the, yeah. the main reason why I'm, I'm bringing it up is is that i i wonder when you read a lot of the studies that that control this are they controlling the diet to where they're in a either you know calorie restricted or more low balanced or balanced type of diet or are they looking at the average american diet which is really full of crap so the, the ones that i read mm. what they're doing is they're just taking people and they're not changing anything they're just oh, saying, really? and then they're just throwing just fish oil it into yeah, it. yeah they're just oh, giving okay, that, fish that's oil. interesting to me, so it's like fish oil versus placebo. Because no. that's why I feel like every doctor, Cairo recommends fish oil, and you know if you don't if they don't change their diet, I'm like you yeah. know is it really yeah. doing anything for them? How often do you think that they're rancid? Because I know like that I used to kind of poke uh, you know a hole in it and smell, and sometimes it was it was god awful. I'm like I got to get rid of this batch. It's a food. It's, yeah. it's like any other food. Well, It'll Sal freezes bad. them. He's the one who got me started yeah, on that. Yeah, no, that's the way to go. Yeah. I, I, I started doing that when you said that. First of all, ago. freezing them will preserve, prevent them from going bad. You can put them in the fridge too, but I like to freeze them. Then what happens, some people complain about taking fish oil and then it, it like repeats on them, like they'll burp or something. Oh, oh. God, yeah. Okay, if you freeze it, that doesn't happen. <sighs> so if you freeze it, take it, I, it, it doesn't happen. I, I've had clients do that forever, and people who complained about that, I told them to freeze it, and they said, oh, Totally took care of that mm -hmm. problem right away. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So it was really good. Oh, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, so. Did you guys? Do you guys? Are, I know. I think Justin. Do you still read like the hustle and stuff? Do you follow that? No, I do, just yeah. hustler. Yeah, yeah. You every don't. day I'm <laughs> hustling. Did you read the? Did you read the story on the sharper image guy? Oh, I didn't get to that one. Oh, no. dude, really, really interesting. You guys know Sharper Image, yep. the store, right? Do they still exist? I, I don't know. Look and see if they're, they're gone. I think they might be it's like, gone. It's like super expensive things After, you don't need. Yeah, do you know, do you know his- <laughs> It really is. Do you know like his, story, his story? Is really, his story is really cool. The guy, the guy was born in the 40s, and in the 70s, what? he started Sharper Image, and when he started it- Hey, Doug, you want to get that? Yeah. <laughs> It's the IRS. Yeah, it's right. like when you're in class. Yeah, right. Go ahead and answer the phone here. Yeah, go ahead. Let's it see goes, what's going that's on. That's what I would do, too, if I was a teacher. Answer uh, that shit. Let me find out who's on the phone right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give him to me. Let's Mom, talk to him. Mom, Let's I'm talk to him. I'm in class. Uh, no, so he's, uh, in the 70s, he started uh, Sharper Image, and he had this idea to go, he would go around to all these like conventions and find like these weird tech things yeah. that were just one off the small companies they weren't any of the big guys that were uh, that were doing stuff that was different and odd his big home run the first thing that took him off was uh, a digital watch Oh, so there was like no, way ahead of everybody. Yeah, else. there was no there was no digital watches around that time, 
and he gets he gets this digital watch and what was brilliant about him so he was up here in San Francisco and there was a guy and I in the I want to say the 70s or 80s that was famous for running with shirtless old guy like in his 70s or 80s and he used to run uh run in San Francisco he ran the Golden Gate Bridge every single day mm -hmm. no shirt on old dude like everybody who drove that commute knew who this guy was oh, cool. He finds this guy, he gets him that watch, and he spends all these money on his first time ever, a watch that could keep up with Carl Wah Wah Wah, whatever his name was. I don't remember what his name was, right? Oh, wah, wah, wah. Yeah, and he's got the digital, <laughs> and it explodes, and the dude ends up making millions of dollars. Wow, that's fascinating. Right? Yeah. So Crazy. he ends up doing that. It ends up, I think he goes on like a good 10-year run of making millions. You guys are, and then this is kind of now moving into the, 90s when we were around and we're very familiar with Sharp Image. It was at the peak or it's at its height then with all the cool massage chair and weird stuff like that. And then it takes a, a nosedive, dude. Like we go into a recession, people aren't spending money on weird gadgets like that. And the business almost goes completely bankrupt. I think their stock drops from in you know, the high 50s or 60s all the way down to like $2. And then you know what brought him back? I didn't know he was responsible for this. Hmm. The Razor. Like the Razor, the scooter. scooter. Oh, shit. Yeah. Boy. Oh, wow. He found it in Hong Kong at like a convention, and he was the one who brought the Razor over to the wow. States. Wow. I didn't know yeah, that. That, that thing hit. exploded. Yeah. Yes. Sharper Image is two things for me. Number, It's the number one store that I go into and buy nothing. So yeah. that's number one. I always go into it because yeah. it's cool. Useless tech gear. Never buy shit. Mm -hmm. And then number two, they have really good vibrators. That's about it. Those what? are the two things. Do, oh, they yeah. really have that? Do they have those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I now, know they, they, they're, now, they're oh, not sold yeah. as vibrators, but they're hand mas they're they're massagers. Massage. I think, so I think they're bankrupt now. Let me see. Or they're gone now. Are they still in existence, Doug? Yeah, they're online. I don't okay. think they have stores anymore. I mean, yeah. they got weird shit. So like you know what? So you know what crippled him was he put all of his money into this air <laughs> barbecue pier. cleaner. It's all, that's yeah, automatic. it's all like the the, the combo stuff. He came yeah. out with this in two thousand. He came out with this air purifier that he like he spent so much money Is on. This it. The negative ion one. Yes, or whatever? yeah, oh, and yeah. it did really well initially. And then some uh, magazine, I some notorious magazine back then came out and rated it like the worst air purifier after it already sold tons. Oh, and so man. gave him really bad pub. And then instead of just letting it go, he poured a ton of, ton of money into suing and fighting. And instead of them letting go, they doubled and tripled down. They wrote another article about it saying, not only is it the worst, that it puts out bad. Oh, puts wow. out Yeah, like bad carbon air outside. It puts out bad. It causes cancer. Yeah, yeah Whoa. and <laughs> completely like fucked the company. And I think that's what closed all the stores down wow. and forced them. So I wasn't sure if they completely shut down or they went down just So there's this. a store similar to Sharper Image. Brookstone. Uh, no, it's at Santana Row, oh. and it's called... Called Beta, I think it's called. Have you guys mm. been there? No. Have you guys seen it? Mm -mm. Doug's seen it. No. So it's called Beta, and you go in there, and it's all this weird tech stuff that you're not going to find. Brookstone yeah. is like this too. It's very yeah, something like that, right? Yeah. But there was one thing that was super cool in there that we almost bought. They just didn't have a size that we liked. Mm. It was a picture frame that you hang up on the wall, and then you download paintings and pictures, and it oh, was. Yeah. It looked gorgeous. You could put it up in your house and change your paintings yeah, so and pictures. The Samsung frame. Uh, yeah, we do that too on that one. Like oh, there's you, another yeah, thing? Yeah, you can. Does it look good? The whole gallery. This one looked amazing. The only problem is it wasn't big enough for where we wanted it. We wanted a big one you know, oh, we yeah. could put up. But it looked really, really cool. Yeah, I'm always wondering about that because I used to be really into like all the gear stuff and, and like all those different, um, you know, type, gadgets. Yeah, gadgets and things. And it's like, what's left? You know, what's left that's really like futuristic other than like hol like little holograms or, you know, like. No, I, I, there's so much, bro, still. Dude, like, look, look it up on the thing right now. What is that thing hanging by yeah, the coat? Yeah, but coats? that's all just like, it, it, I mean, this is just like yeah, lame but, gadgets. Yeah, you know it's, it's lame to us right now because you don't understand it. We don't use it, but that's this is how these, this okay. is what he was known for what, what he was it? known for was finding like these gadgets that most yeah. people would think is stupid well let's see you clicked on one doug what is that called right there closet ionic air purifier yes because I, I want my shirts to have purified <laughs> why? air. why yeah so you know what this reminds me of stink okay you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of every 80s dad in the movies that was an inventor so in the yeah. 80s every movie where there's a dad that's an inventor well, he makes weird 
doodads okay, and gadgets. Well, and, and you know what's funny about that is you go back, you watch all those movies, and it has that uh, one thing in common. It's always like um, Rube's Goldberg or what, what's oh, it called? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's so like a, it, it's some, yeah, some like bowling ball gets knocked down, and it goes down this track, and then it hits this coffee can, and then it swings yeah. over. Makes a chicken lay an yeah, egg. <laughs> just to like unscrew a dog, a can of dog food, and then dump it in its thing. Yeah. It's like that was the invention. So <laughs> Every funny, invention. I think you're, it's called something like that. There's like a, a name for these kind of inventions where they're they're extremely complex to perform very simple tasks. Yeah, one task. stupid task. Yeah, there there was this one I watched online where this guy put one together and it started in his front yard. And I, the whole no joke, the whole video was 10 minutes long. And it starts in his front yard and it goes through the front yard, through he's got like this pond what, what or whatever. What is it? It goes over his, his roof, into his backyard, down this freaking alley. It's like the most It's like insane. knocking over dominoes, but it just has all this cause and effect uh, just to get to what's, one What are those objective. called, dog? Rube Goldberg? It's Rube Goldberg, something like that. Rube, something like Rube, that. Rube something. Yeah, So and you can find these online. And <laughs> what did you just pull up? Oh. <laughs> these are like crazy Japanese inventions. Wow. What is that face one up there? She's wearing <laughs> oh, to prevent splatter from eating soup. Or yeah. noodles. Because, you know, it's embarrassing when you splatter your face, but that's way less that's, embarrassing. That's not embarrassing. To wear yeah, yeah. a big sun thing yeah. around your Some face. Some weird wow. mane. Hey, look at the one on the bottom left. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a napkin a, lion's mane. That's a helmet to prevent your head from going forward when you fall asleep on the subway. <laughs> no, it's, what is that? <laughs> that is. That is exactly what that is. Huh? <laughs> what? Yes, yeah, Japanese tend to fall asleep on the subways and trains. So, so it has a, their a, head from a, falling over. It has a plunger on the back, <laughs> and she plunges her head against the window to keep... That is hilarious. Hey, look at this. Look at the one in the middle. It's if you if you're like to cry or whatever. It's a yeah. toilet paper roll. And it's above your head, so you just yeah. pull it down. It's pulled uh, down. Oh no! It'll blow your nose. Like, wow! Above your head I can't believe we lost paper. the election. That, well, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's hilarious. I know a few people I could buy that for. Yeah. 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 Hey, so so Adam, how annoyed is Katrina that you found another sport to watch on TV? <laughs> like, be honest with me. You found another sport to watch. Well, this is actually one of the, my favorite things about my wife is that, uh, and this is what you know. She keeps it in. No, <laughs> she. I, mean, I tell you what, this is a true story. Uh, this is there's there's been multiple moments of like when people ask me like, oh, when did you know for sure she was the one? Well, I've fallen deeper in love with her every year for for ten plus years, and one of the things I'll never forget, I'll never forget coming home from work, and probably the first year that we were together, and uh, you know I walked upstairs from a long day. And uh, she was in the living room all by her. There's obviously no kids, nothing like that. She's in the living room by herself watching ESPN. And I'm like, oh, I love this woman. <laughs> and so this is, you know, oh, I'll come home on it. Like, I'll miss. That is a unicorn. I, heard yeah, angels. I, ah. I'll work sometimes on a Sunday. She'll be watching football all by herself. So she loves sports. I mean, she was a competitive athlete, right? Yeah. So she, and she doesn't discriminate. Like she likes all sports. And we just got done. I told you guys. I've got sucked into that Netflix, uh, the Formula One. So yeah. I'm on second season. I, I, I binged the first season. I'm on second season right now. And because what I'm, to tell you, be honest, what I'm really excited about this sport uh, that's different than maybe other sports I picked up. I picked up hockey when I was in my 20s. Uh, there was a lot going on to learn all that and figure that out. Formula One was relatively easy to kind of become a fan of it because it's so small. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only, there's literally only 10 it's teams very limited. and there's only 20 drivers. Yeah. It, did, it didn't take me very long to learn all the teams, learn all the drivers. And then there's, you know, basically I think they have like a race almost every weekend when the season starts. So there's, there's only so many races. It's pretty easy to follow. So when do you start betting on it? I, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. That's when I know yeah. you're in. Well, yeah, but you, you know what? I, so I, I only bet on, I only bet on basketball and football because I watch, uh, I watch it. And, and when I bet basketball, I only bet, uh, Warriors because I watch every game. I feel like you, um, and I know if I'm if I'm you know getting sucked into gambling, I'm starting to bet on other stuff, and I, I think it's uh, irresponsible to bet on stuff that you're not really like watching all of it. So you have somewhat of an educated guess, right? So it's a 50 50 chance in gambling sports, no matter what. I think if you're going to be decent at it, you should have. Uh, you know, you should have no. some. You should have. A, I mean, I'm up yeah, right now. I mean, know. you guys. I've told you guys. I've been like, I try. I have not not tracked this entire season, and so you know, I don't know if you if I've if I've told you guys or you guys have been over the house since then. But you know, I hit the quarter mark, so this is you know we're at the end of the the first quarter, and uh, you know, it it uh, it funded my my two new surround sound setups that I got. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I got deal. some Kev. I got a Kev speakers down in my, the the lower part of the house upstairs. I bought some Bowers and Wilkins. 
which are really nice setups for the the TVs and well, stuff. Well, that's and, smart. And it's all sponsored that's by That's smart because at least now now you can't do anything <laughs> with that money. Like, well, that's you can't how gamble it again. Yeah, that's how I justify it, right? So and if I would have not, I wouldn't have bought those So if things. you lose you're going to sell them? <laughs> no. No, it's the, that's Where the speakers go out of? I'll break it up like in quarters like that, right? And Katrina was asking me. She's just like, "Whoa, another I'm like, "Hey, it's on, it's on the it's on the gambling it's on the gambling thing." It's on my side job. Yeah, yeah. It's a, we, <laughs> we won, so I'm a total but rounder. She I mean, she loves it. She's into it. We both got into the show and and uh, the, actually, this weekend was the first time. So I, I told you guys when I originally was talking about Formula One that I have, like, I kind of peered in on it. I knew a tiny, tiny bit about it, and I still know very little about it. This, in fact, this was my first beginning to end watching an entire race, and I, you know, I really enjoyed it because of what I what I know now. Because of the what, it, how brilliant is that for like for Netflix to do things like that? I can't mm -hmm. I I can't be the only one who's now. I had a bunch of people DM me too that said like, "Oh my God, I'm a fan now." Oh, that's great. The show has turned so many people on to watching it. I didn't realize how much kind of behind the scene drama is going on, and it sucked me in. Well, I, I wonder if like Ultimate Fighter sort of did that for the UFC. Of course, of course, it's like hundred percent. Are you did. kidding me? That fight between uh, God, no, I can't remember the, the who are the who was Forrest, that Forrest Griffin, Forrest Griffin and, and, and Stephen Bonner. There you go. That right the there, epic it's one. Of, it's still the top ten ever UFC yeah. fights. It actually, it actually is credited with making the UFC profitable right. again. Was was all that? Yeah, right? so. yeah, yeah. I mean, people do have to buy into the whole drama of it and really just get inside information. That's the worst. Is when you go to a, a sporting event, you just don't you don't know what it takes to kind of well, pull this off. You that's, have to be invested. That's yeah. what, to me. That's what makes. Uh, all sports so amazing is when you start to learn enough about like even like a lot of people think baseball is so boring but baseball has so many little things that are happening behind the scenes and every every move or maneuver. go stand behind home plate and watch you know a 90 mile an hour fastball oh that's the yeah. just just watch it see yeah. like, like pretend you can hit that the yes. good fucking luck the two most impressive things I've ever seen in my entire life were a 300 pound uh, pro football players run okay that was terrifying to see in real life yeah it's like it's like a train yeah. going faster than I thought someone could run anybody and then a, a fastball mm -hmm. you, you watch a fastball live it doesn't make any sense at all how you could even hit that yeah. well that it, it was so much fun when we went uh, before the game started we went to a Niners game uh, and we went down on the field so we were able to get on the field with my boys and uh, they were just warming up and, and catching balls. And, you know, one of the players came over and said hi. It was really cool. Uh, but they were starting to run drills and just like running drills. And one of the guys came so close to hitting us. And he was like a monster. You know, <laughs> my boys are just like, oh. oh. Yeah. But you just don't realize, you don't put it in perspective until you're like on their level. It's not well, the you same. Well, you guys are also talking about the physics of the game. Like I'm talking about, there's there's games within the game. That's what makes oh, yeah, still strategy. Like that's, yeah, like, yeah. So, and Formula One has a lot of that, right? So there's yeah. like if you if you start to learn the behind the scenes drama, like let's say there's, there's a, like beefs. Well, yeah, there's major beefs, and yeah. there's and there's a lot of money on the line and contracts, and you know you would think so. That's something I didn't know until I started watching this. Uh, most all Formula One teams they have they have two they have two drivers. Rarely ever do the drivers like each other because yeah. they're competing. Mm -hmm. They're competing for the contract to be the number one guy. They want to win the race too, and so. You'll see. And so, if you know this going into the race, and you're watching, yeah. am the, I shake or am I bake? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah. you're watching some of the stuff that these guys do. You get, and then the same thing was how I fell in love with hockey. You know, when you find out what you know what the enforcers are on the team, and you can watch a certain player hit the ice, and you know his job is to go to the other team and go fuck a guy yeah. up, and that could be completely completely away from the puck. One, you want know, no, you're right. It's just human nature. You know, there was one thing that happened was very controversial, super dramatic that exploded viewership for figure skating. Do you guys remember Nancy T Kerrigan and Tanya Harding? That's right. <laughs> that was yeah. That literally boomed uh, figure skating. And if for for the listeners who don't know, look it up. Literally, uh -huh. somebody hired a hitman. Oh, if you have not the most to break hilarious her competitor's drama I've ever heard. If you haven't watched like a movie, the Tanya documentary is phenomenal. Oh. I've watched it multiple times. It's so good. That's, oh, a, that's crazy. That's a really really good uh, documentary. Speaking of good movies, dude, great movie. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's like an, one of those in theater movies that you can rent at home. Uh, it's called Minari. I think it's called. And it's about a very heartwarming movie about this Korean family that they're immigrants and they're in America and they buy farmland in middle America to try to 
to succeed and, and start a farm mm. is such a good movie. It's one of those movies you totally get pulled in and just really feel. That's your best pitch on it? I love it. I really? love it. Oh, bro, immigrants trying to make it with honest, hard work and the challenges that they over. Of course, for me, that's very personal, right? Because right, right, my yeah. family's immigrants. How did it do? Is it, is it, is it, I mean, it was a Sundance it. Film Festival, uh, like winner. It's uh, super highly ranked. I mean, you can look up Rotten Tomatoes and see uh, what it's. Did it uh, just get ranked. released? I haven't even seen the preview for it. It is. It got released on, uh, you could get it in the, uh, on Amazon Prime, but you have to pay like 20 bucks because it's like one of those in theater movies. Oh. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's one of those. It's not super exciting. There's not a lot of How you know, it, action, it, yeah, that was, but it's great. Look at that. Rotten Tomatoes. Look at the rating. Wow. 98%. Wow, wow. Justin, how was your weekend? It was great. <laughs> I mean, we went to Sanctuary, so we got we got to get away for a bit, uh, and we haven't actually connected like that in a long time, like Courtney and I, so it was just like great to be removed from the dogs, from the kids, from... You know, and, and we have a, like a lot of we're we're kind of back and forth right now too with what to do with our house situation and all this stuff. Like we've been living in the same place for eleven years now, uh, and uh, had all these plans to remodel, make it big and massive, and all this. But then you know, there's like a house that pops up on the market here and there that we're kind of enticed by, and it's just like a lot of questions and unknowns. And so you know, this kind of helped us to just like slow down and, and be like, oh, dude, we're in a really good place. This everything's working out just fine and uh you know just to to chill and be in the sun and all that so we've we had a great nice how long has it been since you you and courtney had had two days back to back with no kids no dogs i i want to stay i don't know man it's probably like i don't know over a year or so yeah, yeah. you, you yeah. have to do it dude yeah you have to do it you have to like otherwise it should it starts to get like monotonous and and scheduled and stressful and whatever oh yeah yeah i mean and, and all that's it, it, the thing is we're a team and we're always like kind of covering for each other but it's just like when you keep doing that and you keep um you know going about your your day and your business you just you you forget to to just hang out yeah. you know and like uh, and connect and stuff and so yeah, that, that place is so magical, man. Like, you I know, just, the waves crashing and everything in the morning. The only thing that we had, like, these kids above us, like, the second night that were just stomping everywhere. Like, all, like little all kids or, like, teenagers? Crazy. Yeah, yeah, little kids. Like, oh, little kids. Like, what are you doing? Which is rare there. You don't yeah. see that very often. They're like, oh, sorry, we, we usually don't put kids above, you know, on the top floor. And, and I'm like, yeah, that was a problem. Then you guys just have loud-ass sex at night. Yeah. <laughs> Take that. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Take, like, here's yeah, some inappropriate this is, noise. This is what's happening. For you guys right now. <laughs> yeah! You know, you know, it's it's so true that, and I don't care how um, how healthy or how good of a relationship you claim you have, it really does take an, an effort to to make sure you do those things. I mean, that was, you know, Katrina and I figured that out a long time ago, and and just made a deal that we would just we would put things on the calendar ahead of time because life hits you and when you got kids and shit going on and like you said when you're, you're like a team so oh she's covering the house i got this going on over here then when you yeah. switch i'll get the kids you get the dogs you'll do this and before you know it months and months and months start passing by and you haven't spent quality time with this partner you know but there's just so many things that you got to put in perspective that you just like you, i don't you, you you lose sight of like so she's been at the house for an entire year basically like a prisoner you know because like you gotta you gotta make sure you manage the kids to get through these stupid zoom calls and then all the work and everything else on the computer and to keep them you know focused it, it ends up like eating up the entire day and yeah. like she just looks forward to when i come home and it's like underneath the redwoods in the dark and so it's just like um you know a lot of these things i didn't put in you know to perspective with like okay we need somewhere where there's more sun and we need like you know we need we need more room and all this kind of stuff it's just that it's coming out ahead where a lot of this uh you know stuff that that you just kind of go about your thing and don't realize it's been building up building up building up and and it's going to become a real and, massive issue if we don't take care of and, it and and you got to be around other people and because of covid people were afraid to be around each other so you're an right. adult uh, you know, at least we get to come here and talk to each other, right? And have this like stimulating conversation. But like, this is like Jessica. She's at exactly. home. It's her and the baby, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's no adults. There's no stimulating conversation. There's no connection. Exactly. So it's like, and then I come home, same thing. She's excited to talk to me and maybe I'm tired. So mm -hmm. like, ah, I just want to watch TV. Yeah. Well, that's not a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you come we'll home. talked all day. Yeah. yeah I'm at, I've had lots of connecting time with adults. I'll just chill, you know, yeah. not good. You yeah. know, you were talking about buying uh, houses and stuff, man. I tell you what, dude, I am all, I'm constantly playing this game 
where I sometimes want to, sometimes I don't want to, just because of where we live. Right. Because well, that's why I'm so back and forth. Because it just it doesn't make sense. You know, sometimes it might. You know, it's just like you got to really value it. The logical side of me, right, looks at the cost of, to buy a house in the Bay Area, the amount of capital that would it would tie up, and what I could do with that capital of from an investment standpoint makes no sense. The emotional side of me, which was raised by old school, you know, Sicilian parents who are like, must own your house that you live in, mm -hmm. never rent or whatever. I'm like, in, you know, in my, I play this game, right? And I look at house, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll get that one. I'm like, but then I'd be tying up all this and I could do that with it. And it's like, ah, right. it's well, back the, and forth. Well, I mean, the truth is that no investor would, would tell you it's a smart investment right now because it, none of the houses in the Bay Area pass the 20X rule. Everything, everything is it exceeds price. So the house, in fact, yeah, you wouldn't be able to rent it. In at fact, all they would tell you know the twenty X rule was designed to help people with like when they should sell a house, right? So most people who have owned a home for more than three or four years in the Bay Area, uh, it's beyond twenty X, and so so explain what you're saying. The twenty so you take the you take what the house would get rent for. So for like so figure whatever the going rate is yeah whatever the going market. rate is for for the entire year, and then you multiply that by twenty. If the number is lower, the rent number is lower, then the house is valued, overvalued. It's valued too high. Mm. And that would be a good indicator to sell it. Sell it. Cash it out. It's well over 20, 20x. If it's under, it's a great buy. So like when we make investments on real estate, they're all under. So it's a, it's a great buy because we could technically rent it for more than what we would actually pay the mortgage for it. Mm. And in the Bay Area, you, I've done this a, a, a ton of, and that's what always stops me. I'm like, man, I really like this house, and, and I'm, I'm trying to t I'm telling myself it's doing the same thing you guys are doing. Yeah. And then I plug, I calculate it out, and it's like, so let, let's try this out, right? Yeah. So in San Jose, just to give people uh, watching uh, some context, right? In San Jose, if you were to buy. A D, like an okay, not a great, but just an okay, you know, I don't know, 2,000 square foot, four bedroom house that's not broken down or whatever. You're going to spend what? Like 1.4, 1.5? Yeah. yeah. Which one would you say is probably more accurate? That's around there. 1.4, 1.5. Okay. So, so one, let's say 1.4, 1.5. Yeah. That same house you would rent- for about five thousand. Oh, not even. You're lucky if you're getting unless you're in, you're in a nice area. You probably get four thousand something for mm -hmm. it. Let's just say five, even to play that game, okay. right? So five thousand. So to do that rule, I'd go times twelve and then times twenty. Yeah. Okay. Times twenty one point two. Right. So the house is one point four, one point five. Right. The this does not pass. Right. It's, that. It's two hundred thousand the opposite direction. Right. And so the problem with that is if you buy the house, it, you're, you're locked into it forever. That's it. You can't. And that's the thing that that's why there's it's no a, escape unless the market keeps climbing. Exactly. Which, that's why it's a bad investment. And even if it still keeps climbing, you're still forced to sell to get out of it. Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, in a, in a in just a, not smart investing. Right. Right. If you you read uh you know what not rich who wrote rich dad poor dad he wrote real estate riches and the idea is that to keep the properties. It's not to, you know, play the, I mean, and a lot of people play the game where they, they buy the house they live in and then they wait five years, they sell and they upgrade and they do that. Always and, speculating on the price. Right. You're, you're complete speculation, but a, a smart investment would be to buy the house, keep the house when you're ready to upgrade, you keep the house still, you rent it out for cash flow, and then you move to your next place. Yeah. One of the rules that it might've been in rich dad, poor dad, or maybe the one you're talking about, he said, never, uh, your house that you live in is not an investment or an, it's, it, it's a liability because you live there. Right. If shit goes bad, the place you live is screwed. Now, if you're renting it and it's on the side, now if something happens, you're okay because the place you live is not, is not. Yeah. A That's what just makes it so hard to buy in the Bay area right now. Is it? And you know, there's a lot of people and it, by the way, too, if you read all the articles on what can they speculate in this year and next year to continue to rise it's here because the inventory is low mm -hmm. you know so there is a very good chance that it'll keep going up and if you did buy a house in the bay area that in five years from now it'll be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars more than what it is yeah. but again you're Some still people are making a shit ton of equity right right now. you're still trapped though you are and you're still you're st unless you're putting 50 percent down on it if you're putting the at what the most people are putting down 20 to 25 tops percent down to your point uh, and on a one point five million dollar, you're tying up three hundred thousand minimum. Plus, yeah, three hundred thousand plus dollars. Yeah, now, what could you do with three hundred thousand dollars in other areas yeah, for buy, investments? Buy three to five houses, and each else. one of them making you money, cash flowing from rent. Right. right. And again, you're you're not you're not tied down to, you know, uh, having to live there to pay it. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's it's actually making at least breaking even or making you money. So. You know, I, I mean, I, we're all in the same boat with the the idea of, of doing that. It's hard to do that, you know, to to justify, 
buying the place that you live in here. And, and people will be like, oh, what about the tax benefits? Well, you know, there's lots of tax benefits to investing out of state and doing other things with your money. So the tax, be- especially now, because they really, they cap the tax benefit. You know yeah, that, right? right? Like you can't, mm-hmm. you don't get any more benefits past 750. But so then it don't matter. Have, but then the average house, like you just said, you know, your track home is 1.5 million. So you're only getting the, the tax benefits on 50% of that. It's funny. I know there's people listening in most parts of America who are oh, like, like 1.5. Totally different. Uh, it's just watch a, a TV show on HGTV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I hate that show yeah, yeah, so yeah, bad. Dude, we were watching that this weekend. I wanted to yeah. strangle everybody on there. Yeah. Well, you know, I gave you a $200,000 budget. Like, yeah. what is this? Like, yeah. all like complaining. Yeah. yeah. Like, $200,000 here, budget. Dude. Here's like, I remodeled yeah. my garage. Well, yeah. Seriously. <laughs> you know like, I made a shack outside. It's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm going to take a left and talk about one of our sponsors because uh, this has only happened to me a couple times since we've had the podcast. So we get approached by sponsors all the time who want to work with us and whatever. And the, our, we have a very stringent criteria for working with companies, right? We have to, number one, of course, believe in the product. We have to all try it. We have to all use it regularly, really like it. We have to like the people we're working with. They could have a great product. If we don't like the people, we're not going to work with them. It's also got to provide value to our audience. So it can't be just some one-off type of thing that maybe I like because of my whatever It's got to have like lots of value, right? So, but every once in a while, one of our sponsors will bring a new product that they have. So we're already working with them. This happened with, uh, with Ned, Ned's hemp oil by far is the best on the market. I've used them all. I'm a big CBD guy. Anybody who's listened to the podcast for a long time knows I talk about cannabinoids because it's helped my gut health from day one significantly. They have the best hemp oil, right? But they came out with another product and it was, it's their mellow and it's this magnesium based supplement. And only happened to me a couple times where I look at something and I just briefly looked at the ingredients and I go, ah, oh, it's not gonna have, it's magnesium, big deal. I'm not yeah. gonna, I'm, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. And it literally sat in our studio for like months. I yeah. think it was months. Yeah. Then I finally picked it up and I did a little digger, a, a little, little bit deeper digging, and I saw that one of the forms of magnesium was created by MIT as the only form of magnesium to cross the brain, uh, you know, the- the, the, Blood-brain barrier. Right, exactly. So I tried it, blew my mind. Since then, I've been introducing it to all kinds of family members and friends, and everybody's like, what is this? This is incredible. My sister actually messaged me last week that it's her favorite product now. Mm -hmm. She's like, holy shit. I heard you guys talk about Mellow last, whatever, commercial, whatever it was, a couple weeks ago when we first talked about it. And she's like, I just tried it last night for the first night. And she's like, it blows away. I was a little worried because I felt like, you know, they peaked when they made their sleep product. Right. Because it was so good. It was so like, it works so well. And it's like something that we would just mention and be like, I I know for sure if you try that, like it's going to work like that. And then so, yeah, it it was a little bit of skepticism uh, on my own part and Courtney's part as well with Mellow. But uh, we took it like like an hour beforehand, just started to really chill out the, the rest of the night and then. Boom, out like a light. Now, oh, amazing. The, the, now, is what is so, is is it that they are the only ones that are using this type of magnesium? Does nobody else use that? No, or? other people have used this form of magnesium, and there's three different types of magnesium. So they picked specifically uh, a combination of three types that's going to be effective. Because you're the problem with magnesium. First of all, most people are deficient in magnesium, especially if you're in a lot of stress, you get poor sleep. Right. The side effects of being too low in magnesium are like anxiety, mm-hmm. restlessness, um, your immune system is low, and if it gets real bad, bone loss, muscle loss, that kind of stuff. But mainly it's like if you just feel kind of edgy, bad mood, that kind of stuff, right? That's what happens typically when people are too low. The problem with most magnesium is you, it just doesn't get absorbed. It's like a, it's basically a laxative. You take most magnesiums on the market, and it just helps you poop. That's about it. It's really? not gonna, Yeah, absolutely. Go take most of them, and you'll notice that you'll have a, a big poop, but there's nothing – really happening in terms of how those, you those feel. Effects. Absolutely. Oh, huh. interesting. This particular, and also combines GABA. There's also GABA in this product, which yeah. really I think takes it over the top. Right. But with this particular product- And theanine, right? Is uh, it theanine's GABA, in there also. GABA, theanine, and then the magnesium. Proven, proven stuff. This, the magnesium uh, threonate that's in there has been shown to improve cognitive function even. So it's actually been shown to help to make people- think more clearly and more sharply. Mm-hmm. The difference between sleep and this is sleep 
will put you to sleep. Yeah. Mellow literally chills you out. Yeah. So you can take it to sleep or you can Any just tell- anxiousness is pretty much absolved. Yes. So I did this yesterday. I had uh, a little bit too much caffeine. I was texting you guys and you guys, I can sure you guys could tell. Took some mellow and it took the edge off. Oh, I didn't get. See, that's I, I didn't go I, to sleep, but I just felt. I good. haven't tested it like that. Yeah. I want to test it like because every once in a while I make that mistake where I do too much caffeine or go too late, and then that always fucks my sleep. And no, I, it'll balance you out right oh, away. Oh wow, yeah. I gotta yep. try that. Yep. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this podcast. Real quick, head over to mindpumpfree.com and get some of our free written content. We got a bunch of books and guides there for free. Go check them out. You can actually don't download all of them and it costs you nothing. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. All right, enjoy the rest of the podcast. Our first question is from Soraya Graham. Can limited flexibility or range of motion inhibit gains? For example, will a reduced range of motion in a hip thrust prevent me from maximum mu- muscle growth? Or will I see growth because this is my max extension? Yeah, 100% lack of mobility can inhibit uh, muscle growth. And there's a, yep. there's, a, a, there's a range of how much it impacts you. And that has to do with your how bad your range of motion is. If your range of motion and mobility is so bad that you can't, for example, barbell squat, which is th- one of the most, if not the most effective lower body exercise. So you can't do barbell squats then you're not going to build as much muscle. There's a cascading effect. Absolutely. If your range of motion is limiting you by a couple inches, it's going to make a small difference maybe. But studies are very clear. Good, long, appropriate, I have to say appropriate because I don't want people to to push their range of motion past their mobility. Mm -hmm. But appropriate range of motions, if you have a a deep range of motion, you compare it to a shallow range of motion, both appropriate, the deep range of motion is going to build more muscle and give you strength that spans a greater range, right? So if you, let's say, let's say I do a curl and I go six inches, most of the strength that I gain is gonna be in that six inches. If I do a 12 inch extension, then it's gonna be to the 12 inches. So more strength across a broader range and it equals more muscle. Shout out to uh, Soraya, I remember who this is. So I met her at uh, Orange Theory, God, probably four year, four plus years ago now, maybe more, five years ago now. Um, and, I, and I was helping her, she wanted to develop her glutes. <clears throat> and by the way, she's got an incredible physique already, but she was very quad dominant. And I remember watching her train inside Orange Theory and giving her some exercises to do to help that out. And definitely what it, it, she lacks the depth in her squat. So she's got she's got a good form, good technique mm. uh, down to like 90 degrees or whatever. But breaking that 90 degrees and getting really good depth, uh, I think her, her ankle mobility and hip mobility kind of limit her from getting that deep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had her doing some things in the, in, the, in the class that I would add specifically for her to help her out with uh, developing the glutes. Now, to Sal's point, um, I 100% agree. I do want to add, though, that I wouldn't eliminate the hip thrust because of that, right? So just because the hip thrust is a uh, shorter range of motion, uh, I wouldn't eliminate it as a great exercise for you still to build your glutes. Yeah, it's like, complimentary. Yeah, a- absolutely. Still continue to do hip thrust, but in conjunction with also working on the the depth of your squat and working on the mobility and trying to get yourself to a place where you can do a full range of motion squat. Yeah, and I think too, like, I mean, to, to play sort of the other side of it, there's unfavorable uh, movements and, and things. And, and when you're just really trying to seek like excessively like wide ranges of motion and like a lot of these like mobility guys really geek out and get into this kind of stuff but I was uh, trying to explain to my son who I had brought up on the podcast before I was doing all the, the Russian dance where it's like <laughs> basically you're squatting your butt's almost hitting the floor but then you're jumping and he's kicking his legs out like that and he really like hurt his knee uh, and, and I'm trying to explain to him, like doing all that explosive movement, you know, in that position and that kind of a lever on, on like, and your knee is going to suffer from that. Like that's not favorable, uh, for you, uh, to, you know, to, to, to provide strength and, and support. But, uh, obviously, you know, that's something that you kind of work up towards, but there's certain like ranges where it's like ideal, like, yes, a lower position, you're going to get gain the full amount and it's going to like translate more to your glutes. And like a lot of times, like people don't break that plane, uh, uh, and it needs and it requires more uh, ankle support and ankle mobility. Yeah, you you're, you got to train. Your range of motion has to be appropriate. You have to own the range of motion. So I don't want people to listen to this and be like, oh, deeper is better. So then they go right, right. they go past what they can control. And they compromise. That, that means you're going to hurt yourself. That happens a lot. It does. You have to own the range of motion. So the idea is to train in the largest range of motion that you own. So that's it. And then, and then from there... 
If you want to work towards getting a larger range of motion, be careful. Use mobility and correctional exercises and don't load until you own that range of motion. I also know that Soraya was, obviously she was doing Orange Theory, so she was big on the you know the circuit training type of classes. So hopefully you've eliminated those classes and, you, and you're doing more strength training because there's two other things that I would include uh, for you that we didn't talk about. Uh, good mornings. Uh, I would definitely include for you. And then I'd also do uh, sumo deadlifts. And then hopefully when you're doing things like hip thrusts and extra like that, you, you're, you're able to look like you're doing it with the barbell and loading heavy. I mean, we were doing this in a class setting. So I had her like, you know, doing floor bridges with, you know, dumbbells on her mm -hmm. hips where she should be, she was strong too. So she's a very strong girl. She should be doing 200 plus pounds on hip thrust and be able to do good mornings, probably pretty loaded too. So I would focus on those three movements. Next question is from Malibu Banks. After doing deadlifts, how do you know if you're just really sore, if your form wasn't correct and might have caused a small injury? Okay, so soreness versus mm -hmm. injury. You know, when I used to hear this from clients, I used to always kind of scratch my head like, how do you know? Yeah. How do you not know the difference? It's kind of obvious. But then I realized that people just aren't in their bodies, right? If you don't exercise a lot. Yeah, you, if it's a new stimulus. Yes, and, I, and you see this with kids a lot. When I do certain exercises with my kids, they and they get sore. Like my daughter will wake up and she'll be like, you know, call me from her room and I'll be like, what's the matter? She's like, I hurt my legs. Yeah. And I'll be like, you hurt your legs. And I'll be like, show me where it hurts. And then I'll move her around. And I'll be like, you're sore, honey. Like she yeah. doesn't know the difference between soreness and pain. So I can kind of get that. All right. So soreness is in the muscle. Pain and it's in the muscle and you don't see lots of inflammation. You don't see uh, discoloration. And uh, it doesn't cause uh, major dysfunction, typically, right? You can get super sore to the point where that, where that happens, in which case I would consider that almost an injury. Injuries you typically feel in the joints. So if you're doing deadlifts, you might get some soreness in the muscles that run up and down the spine. You might get some soreness in your hips. You might get some soreness in your forearms. But you shouldn't have pain in the spine, in the actual yeah. spine or in the hip joint. That's typically uh, where you're you're either injured or you're about to get injured. Well, on to just like uh, more of a shooting pain, like more of a you know, electricity almost, where it's like you start to move in a direction and then <clears throat> you, it, it limits you and it inhibits like the the movement uh, completely to where you have to kind of sit down. You have to adjust what you're normally doing to where you, you you really can't pull it off. I would say that that's something that you know is more towards the injury spectrum. Uh, but yeah, it's funny because a lot of times too people get sore in stabilizing muscles in there and it's it's hard to distinguish like right. what that is right <laughs> it's even happened to me one time where i'm like oh my god it's my kidney or my liver or something and it's <laughs> yeah. just like my oblique yeah. you know like i haven't had a, a sore oblique or a sore ql and it's just uh you know they did something where they twisted or rotated it and their their body had to really brace really hard and they didn't realize typically too uh, an injury will uh either get worse over time and or will take a long time mm. uh, where soreness will get progressively better, right? So like if you get sore and you feel really, really sore, typically, sometimes day two of being sore is really bad, right? But normally day three, day four, day five, day six, every day you feel progressively better yes. when you're sore. Mm -hmm. um, many times when you're, you've injured something, you've strained a, a ligament or your, your joints are hurting so that it will, it will hang around much longer and sometimes even get... And it doesn't feel better when you move it. That's, yes. a, that's a big one. If you're sore, you can move the muscle and that's right. feel a lot better. That's Injury, right. you move it, it feels worse. Right, like, yeah. like you were using your, your daughter, for example. Like if her, her legs are hurting because they're sore and you were to put her in like, and you stretched her for a good 20 minutes, she would feel better after right. that. So if you, if, you get, if you stretch or do yoga or do mobility and it seems to make whatever wherever you feel feel better good chance of that, that soreness if it feels worse when you're doing stuff like that be careful it could be an in injury next question is from dragon from india what are the top 5 must haves for longevity and health are they attainable without spending a ton of money on supplements, gym member memberships, et cetera? Yes. Okay. Health and longevity. Yes. Most of these things I'm about to say are, are definitely attainable. And I'm going to use general categories because we could break down each category and get into specifics or whatever. So I think the first thing is good, appropriate physical activity. Now, of course, we talk about physical activity on the show all the time. We talk about the, our favorite types and what types are the most beneficial, blah, blah, blah. But generally speaking, Good, appropriate physical activity. 
Diet is the other one. So uh, a good, healthy diet. Again, we can get into specifics, so it's much more complex than what I'm saying, but that's one of them. The next one is uh, your family and relationship health. So are you, do you have good relationships yep. with the people around you and your family and your kids and your spouse? That's very important uh, for health. Then there's spiritual health, okay? By the way, these are all proven. These are all proven with multiple, multiple studies, okay? Spiritual health is very important. Now, people ask, what do you mean by spiritual health? Is it religion? Yeah, that's, religion's one way um, to, to work on spiritual health. It's one of the most time-tested and proven ways, but there's lots of other ways. But essentially, spiritual health is taking that, you know, as, as my friend Arthur Brooks would say, uh, that 40,000 view look at yourself and humanity and the world. It's looking at things from that perspective, that those big uh, thoughts, those deep thoughts, yeah. you know, pondering the meaning of life and, you know, if and there's- Acknowledging a, how small you are. That's it. That's, that's that spiritual health. And are you spending time uh, fostering that, right? On a regular basis, just like you would with exercise, diet, and then your relationships, family, and friends. And then the last one, and then again, this is proven uh, by studies, is to have uh, meaningful, purposeful work. This is actually quite important. Um, in fact, studies show that uh, people's risk of dying, this is a weird one, look this up, people's risk of dying uh, skyrockets after they retire, oftentimes. So here are people working a job all the time, wake up at you know 7 a.m., got to go to work, whatever. Then they retire and they're like, oh, this is going to be so great. I don't have to work anymore. Miserable, depressed. And, and depression goes up, anxiety goes up, and, and death goes up because we're, we are wired to feel like we're productive. We have to feel like we're contributing. Otherwise, we feel like like lost, right? So this can be a job where you get you get paid. It could be volunteer work. It could be whatever, something that you wake up every day and it's hard, it takes effort, but you feel very, lots of purpose and meaning behind. Those Those are the five things. If you got all those and you focus on all those, you have a good chance of better, good health and longevity. Doug, didn't we do an episode on this? Didn't we do... Yeah, I guess we did. Well, <laughs> he I, always asks me these. I, I do. Know. Well, I ask you because I expect that by the time this is over, you'll find it, be, give it to Andrew so Andrew can throw it up in the YouTube. And right now he'll probably put it up right here where you can actually see it on the YouTube oh, channel. Oh, there it is. I saw that. Nice. Hey, that's nice. <laughs> and That's people so convenient. Can, Thanks, Andrew. Because we went in depth uh, with this topic, actually. And uh, I think Sal hit on that. Although I will give you something uh, for those that are not religious or spiritual and but would want to, I would say another way to explain a spiritual health for a non-religious person is the pursuit of uh, ultimate self-awareness emotional intelligence um, I think if if the the whole you know spiritual and religious thing absolutely scares you and you and you don't want to do anything like that I think uh, pursuing self-awareness and EQ is probably uh, the same direction that you're totally yeah you're gonna get in value that you're gonna get from that. Yeah, I think too. I mean, it's it's definitely the relationship, and you've highlighted those uh, studies before. It's just like it's so much bigger than I think uh, society right now even realizes. And this is what worries me the most with uh, the trends of you know the aftermath of a pandemic and where we're all at as a society with you know pushing people away, pushing all our friends, all our family away, masking up, you know, not having those interactions with human beings is really a detriment to our health. And this is something that, you know, it you think you're you know you're protected, you're you're protecting yourself from from all these like uh, you know invading uh, viruses and things out in the world but at what compromise are we uh, you know like facing in terms of doing that versus like what that's going to do towards our long-term health uh, and interactions with other human beings you by the way and uh, this is uh, I, I heard this again from Arthur Brooks you can be alone and lonely and be around people mm -hmm. you can be in a city with lots of people but also be very lonely um, and have uh, health consequences as a result. It's funny. I was having a conversation this weekend with Jessica. We were, it was a beautiful Sunday. God, yesterday was gorgeous. Yeah. And I was sitting outside with Jessica and the, you know, we, the baby, you know, went down for a nap or whatever. And we're, we're talking and she's got an interesting story. So I've, I, I've said this on, I've told a long time ago, I talked about, uh, you know, kind of what she did before on the podcast, but she used to travel with the circus. She used to travel with Cirque du Soleil. So she's had the the amazing opportunity to live in all these different countries. And we were talking about what it's like to live in Spain. What was what's it like to live in 
Italy or Greece or some of these other countries. And she goes, it's so weird. You know, it's like, she's like in Spain, they, they do the siesta, you know? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's weird. And in Italy in the summer, like everybody shuts down in August, everything's closed. Nobody works in August. And they, and, and they spend a lot of time, like lunch will be two hours or three hours. And we're talking about this. And on the one hand, we're like, oh man, you know, you, you could be so much more productive or whatever. And I said, you know, it's funny when you look at the studies on longevity for people who live in these places, even though they smoke more cigarettes and even if they're fat, like Americans are, even if they have obesity, like we do, yeah. they live longer. Why do they live longer? These cultures really value human connection yep. quite a bit. Like yeah. you go to lunch with your friends. It's, it's powerful. I'm telling you in, in, in Southern Italy, if you go to lunch with your friends, here's what it looks like. And I noticed this as a kid, you go to a restaurant in, in, in America when you go there, the, per, the the server brings you your food and your bill at the same time. And right now, if you've never been anywhere else, this is normal for you. It's like you get your food and your bill. They want you to eat and get the hell out. And it's all about eating and getting the hell out. In Italy, uh, it's rude to give you the bill unless you ask for it. And they take their sweet ass time bringing you each thing and you chill. It's like two hours for, for lunch. And I got frustrated at first when I went there as a kid. I'm like, oh, I want to. And then I realized like they're just, they're here to like connect and hang out right. and whatever. It's a social thing. Yeah. So that's a very, very important part of health and fitness fanatics who are unhealthy in their pursuit of fitness. Oftentimes is the one thing they completely throw out the window. It's like, uh, no, it's all about working out. It's all about diet. And they're not connecting with friends. They're not connecting with family. They're not socializing because they're afraid they're going to lose their gains. They're afraid they're not going to be ripped or whatever. Not realizing that their health is suffering as a consequence. Well, I noticed too. We didn't uh, we didn't plug any of our sponsors and, and supplements and talk about biohacking shit. Yeah, like it's all all these things minuscule. don't. A lot of these things don't cost you any money. It's just that uh, they get overlooked. They just and, take effort. And, and and our society always wants to jump to like whatever pill or whatever cool t like the even the way the questions worded that how that's you know, not really expensive like yeah none of these things cost money you know it takes time that takes it. effort you mm -hmm. know but you know it's a it's something that we've lost sight of i feel like as a country sometimes next question is from cassidy hoffman official can my body adapt to neat in the same way it would to cardio y'all talk about body adapting to cardio in a way that you'll have to keep adding more for it to be effective Will the need I employ to prevent weight gain do the same? All right. So if we're talking about calorie burn and fat loss and that kind of stuff, yeah, your body starts to burn less calories. Your body starts to adapt. But here's the problem. And I think sometimes when people hear us talk about this, they get the message that that's all the value of, acti of, of cardiovascular activity or need is, that, is the fat burning effect. There's another side to this, which is it's good for you. You don't have to burn more. You don't have to get ripped. You don't have to burn more. It's just good for you to move. In right. fact, yep. sitting down all day long is worse for you than smoking cigarettes and uh, as bad as having a bad diet. So who cares? Who cares? It's just good for you. It's good for your health. It's right. for your mental health. Good for your physical health. Reduces inflammation, lowers your risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, everything. So forget the fat loss. I think sometimes we get so focused on how's it going to make me look, mm -hmm. we forget about how well, that's good it is we, for that's because we come out and we talk about that, right? Because that's the number one thing that you get asked as a trainer is everybody wants to know the fastest way to lose fat, to get in shape or to look a certain way. And so we address the cardio thing from that perspective so often. It does not mean that we don't think that there's tremendous value in somebody doing a 30 minute bout of cardio every single day. I think that's, mm -hmm. I think it's a great, or an hour even. That's great. If it's something that's a part of your lifestyle and you can maintain that forever, but absolutely the body will adapt to that and it will not be the best way for you to lean out. So you really got to, you have to know who we're trying to communicate that information to. We're communicating it to the masses that think that cardio is a great way to lose body yeah, fat. Yeah, and if they, and they, I only have three hours a week, Sal, what should I do to burn body fat? Well, if you only have three hours a week, lift weights. Right. That's the most effective way. Right. But yeah, moving is good for you, period. Well, even if you put them apples to apples, you got that one hour block or whatever, and like you, you burn X amount of calories calories in that one hour block versus, you know, all day long, you're just up, you're active, you're moving. We've seen this. We've, we've tested this, like how many more, how much more effective you are at, uh, even burning calories. But yeah, like to, to, to what you brought up, it's, it's just beneficial. It's beneficial. You're getting things done in your house. You're expressing all the joints in your body. You're, you're pumping blood.
blood constantly throughout the day. There's just so many recuperative uh, elements to that versus like trying to then now add a, you know, a very specific stress to your body to get a, a, your, your body fat to lower. Totally. And, and one more thing, uh, and I'll, I'll do the, I'll make this argument all day long. One hour of cardio done all at once versus three 20 minute bouts of cardio or whatever. Okay. Everything being equal. The difference is one is done all at once. The other one's done throughout the day. The one done throughout the day will have superior uh, benefits. More carryover to other uh, things. Across the board. Yeah. It's better. It's going to be better for health, joint health, brain health. It'll probably be better even for fat loss to a small degree. It's better to move throughout the day than to dedicate one hour of movement and then the rest of the day sit down, even if the time is all equal. But back to comparing to neat, like neat is technically not none of the exercise. Even walking is technically not neat. I know we've discussed it as if it was. Like neat is supposed to be non-exercise activity mm -hmm. that you you mindlessly do, which would be more like a tick, right? A tick or moving around a little bit in your seat. Like that is like non-exercise movement throughout the day. No matter what what it is, you your body adapts to everything. And it doesn't take very long for it to start to adapt, and then you lose the benefits of the the fat burning from it, right? It's not your, it's not that ideal, but it still doesn't take away from why you should be active all day long. So, it, it, it's it's one of those conversations I feel like we continually have to repeat ourselves that we've, I don't know, we've been labeled as these like non cardio guys, and that's just because ninety percent of all clients that ever hired one of us, if not more than that. Uh, wanted to lose body fat. Mm -hmm. And they think that cardio is the best way to do it. And so we, we're always having to address this. Well, guaranteed 99% of people haven't just deliberately focused on like increasing the amount of activity they have versus like thinking they have to do cardio. So that's why we highlight that uh, more than the other. And, and there's another way to do this. And, you know, eventually you'll get adapted to it. But I, I, I would love to see uh, you try. That's right. Very, very good point. Look, if you like Mind Pump's information, you got to go to mindpumpfree.com. We have some great information, a lot of guides, and they're all free. So these are small books that are available to help you burning body fat and building muscle, getting a better squat. We even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's at mindpumpfree.com. One more thing, you can find all of us on social media. Instagram is our social media outlet of choice. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Working out was only for fighting for me my whole life. I've only thought about trying to fight with people. That's why I want to work out. And then I realized, no, that's it's for your mental health. That's oh. what this thing is. It's all about your mental health. You're in there. You're working your physical. And that's the whole thing. That's and why that's, you never want yeah. to stop. Yeah. And because I look at this today, I'm like, it's easy for me to go.